Uh, Zainab, let me bring you in there fr from Washington. We'll talk about positivity in a moment. When, when you originally saw this story, when you read the details, I mean, you do so much work in this area. But what was the overriding uh, emotion? Was it that you thought it was preposterous, ridiculous, offensive? Did it make you angry? What, what was it? I was absolutely appalled. Um, I was devastated and shocked and horrified um, that any 14-year-old child, regardless of its religion, would be subjected to this kind of treatment um, only because he was excited about it, a clock that he, he built, that, an invention that he created, um, that he would be embarrassed in front of his peers, he would be suspended from school, um, arrested and interrogated like he was some kind of criminal. I mean, I think it's just unconscionable, and I think that we all have an obligation to speak out against the bias and the fear um, and the prejudice that leads to this kind of treatment. Are you absolutely convinced it is bias, it was because he was Muslim, is it not understandable in a way? We know post Columbine and all of those other school incidents, black or white, schools are pretty twitchy. Look, we know that there have been many other instances of other children who have built clocks and they've taken them to school and they have not been arrested, they have not been suspended from school. Um, even if there was any sus suspicion that this was a legitimate threat, um, then we, the, w the school was not evacuated. The question that comes to mind is, why was the school not evacuated? Why weren't um, sw SWAT teams called in? Why weren't steps taken to address it if it was considered a threat? Uh, it's hard not to believe that the fact that Ahmed's last name is Muhammad and the fact that he is Muslim, uh, he's Sudanese-American, that did not play into, into the equation. I mentioned the outreach work you do in the community. How much does a story like this, on rather the extreme end of things, how, how much does that chime with the everyday stories that you're hearing from people? You know, it's, it's actually interesting because through my work, I'm able to engage with youth in various communities, not just Muslim communities, but interfaith communities across the spectrum. And this is definitely one of the most extreme cases I've heard uh, in which the reaction of school administrators and local authorities has been so far-fetched that um, they would, you know, take it to this level. And the, the tragedy is that even though, and the concern is also that even though there has been a lot of support on social Social media, which we definitely appreciate. It's, it's gratifying to see that there has been such an outpouring of support and love for Emma and his family. Um, unfortunately, the school administrators have not apologized. The law enforcement has not apologized. The mayor of Irving has actually defended them, um, and she's defended their actions and the fact that they treated him and interrogated a 14-year-old kid this way. And we have to ask ourselves what kind of message is ascending to other youth, not just Muslim youth, but any youth um, who might be subjected to bullying or fear mongering or discrimination. Zainab, let me go back to, to the point you finished on, which was you were talking about the broader damage, particularly to younger people. Is there a danger, unless these sorts of attitudes are addressed and addressed pretty quickly now, that uh, you run the risk in America of, of alienating this group of young people and potentially, of course, uh, that could come back uh, to, to be problematic at some stage in the future. Absolutely. That's a very real concern. And the fact that we have Emmett's story that's been highlighted um, and it's really uh, gained a worldwide international attention. Um, but we also have to keep in mind that there's many, many other stories like Emmett's that unfortunately are not highlighted. Um, many children, they don't report incidents of bullying or discrimination or harassment, especially in, in, school, in the school place. Um, and that's, that's a phenomenon that we have to be able to address. And it, it's really, it takes a village to raise a child. And it's each of our responsibilities um, as part of that global village to to help children thrive, to encourage their potential and help them live up to their potential. And when we send the message, when we treat children the way that Emmett was treated, we send the message that, you know, we don't respect your potential, we don't want you to thrive. Sure, and, and, and that's the worry, of course. Just a final quick thought, to Zainab. Despite everything you have just said, you must be heartened to, to see and hear your president takes such a definitive stand, be so welcoming, so warm in that uh, tweet that we read out, and invite this 14-year-old to the White House with his clock. 
We are absolutely thrilled that the Emmett has this opportunity to meet with the President of the United States and meet with Mark Zuckerberg and meet with other individuals who really are in a place where they can help impact and shape his future in a positive direction. Um, but at the same time, we also want to hold our elected officials accountable. We want to make sure that policies and strategies like CVE that help bring more fear and mistrust towards the Muslim population within the United States are also addressed and they're also eliminated or tweaked so that they're not alienating of Muslims and they're not treating Muslims in a discriminatory way. Um, that's unfortunately okay. something that contributes to this climate of fear and hostility towards Muslims.